Well, good evening. Uh, welcome to our Shabbat uh, program on the Torah this evening. We are going to address uh, at least three items in the news before we return to Mizmor 89. We're at the uh, 24th statement and the Song of Songs, the Song of Dode. Uh The three things I want to discuss is, first, I am deeply troubled by the three arraignments uh, and criminal charges on uh, Donald Trump. Uh, we've talked about uh, the document uh, fiasco, uh, where he is facing decades of prison time for having uh, documents from his own administration, uh, none of which have any value, none of which are of any uh, threat to the United States. Uh, our top secret documents are absolutely meaningless. Uh, and then uh, to be indicted um, for conspiracy uh, against the United States because of a political rally that he conducted while President of the United States on the Mall. Uh, it is just genuinely astonishing uh, that the U.S. would prosecute a, uh, um, a former president and a man who is running again for president on what really are political charges. Um, documents, the only reason that documents are restricted to former presidents, who had obviously the clearance to, to have them and to read them and to use them, uh, and who need them for their memoirs and for their, their uh, presidential libraries and that sort of thing. Uh, and, you know, a top secret CIA document uh, is about as valuable as yesterday's newspaper. It, uh, it uh, suits putting uh, as a liner on the bottom of bird cages. Uh, the only reason it exists is that uh, the Democrats got angry with Richard Nixon when he uh, did not release White House documents over to those that were trying to oust him from office. And so it's a really stupid law. It has no merit whatsoever. And to make that law a felony offense against a president, when I mean, every elected official of any consequence has violated it in one way or another, current president has, for example, current, uh, the former vice president uh, uh, has, for example, is political prosecution. And to take a speech, now, listen, I, I listened to his speech on uh, Capitol Hill. I, I think he uh, he speaks at the level of a fourth grader. Uh, I think his uh, um, his notions are overly simplistic. I think those that uh, follow him and, and fall in love with him are unthinking morons. Uh, they to me they come across as uh, the religious, uh, completely irrational. Uh, that said, um, it was a political rally, and when you criminalize what somebody says at a at a political rally, particularly at the level of president, then you're treading in exceedingly dangerous waters. And unfortunately, uh, the January 6th uh, melee on the Capitol, uh, which was mostly a photo op for overaged, overpolitical uh, Republicans, um, has turned into this uh, literally a witch hunt where people are being convicted of egregious sentences for trespassing on public property, all because the jury pool in Washington, G.C., and all the prosecutors are insanely liberal and progressive. So there's no chance that Donald Trump's going to get a fair trial. He is going to go to prison unless he cops a plea deal. And if he does that, it will be to keep him from ever running for office again, which is what the Democrats. This is a very troubling thing for America. And for us as a nation, America, to be imposing our will on Israel, saying that we are that the United States is disturbed that they're pursuing judicial reform when we're using our judiciary as a political weapon is um, quite concerning and exceedingly hypocritical. The second thing I want to talk about in the news was what Meldaviv, the uh, former uh, president of, of uh, Russia uh, said he is uh, the second highest ranking 
political influence in Russia. He said, you know, uh, the world, uh, the West, and America and Europe, seem all perplexed that, and uh, frustrated uh, that the, their proxy war against Russia, where they armed with their best weapons, including cluster bombs and, and advanced tanks and, uh, and F-16 fighter jets and the like, to lead this counteroffensive against uh, not only Russian-occupied territories, but their territories where the people want to be aligned with Russians. They are Russians. They speak Russians. Uh, they had their country ripped from them, uh, and they want to stay Russians. Russia is in those places, and that's what the counteroffensive is trying to dislodge. And Melda said something really astute. He said, you in the West ought to be praying for those defenders. You ought to be rooting them on. Because had they not acted bravely and forestalled this counteroffensive, it would have been nuclear war. Russia would have had no other choice but to stop the proxy soldiers using Western weapons from not just crossing that line, but crossing right through our troops into Russian territory. And the only way we could have stopped them is to deploy nuclear weapons, and we would be in a nuclear war today if the United States and the West had succeeded. That's certainly sobering. The third thing I want to talk about in the, the news is a uh, uh, is Thomas Friedman, who is uh, a Jewish anti-Semite. They they exist. Uh, in fact, most progressives in the United States are Jewish anti-Semites. Um, that uh, he uh, talked to um, Biden, had a private interview with Biden right after uh, the uh, uh, congressional address uh, by the President Herzog of, uh, of Israel. And so um, Biden, who had invited Netanyahu to the White House, just wanted to let it dangle and not confirm it. And he didn't want to acknowledge anything Herzog said in his speech. So what did he do? He called the most anti-Semitic reporter in the country, Thomas Friedman. And they had a little chat about uh, uh, what uh, Biden really thought. And so what Biden did is he dangled this little carrot out there and pretended like a big shot that he could bring normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia. Now, I'm telling you that MBS despises that Biden is lower than a, uh, a cockroach. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and yet uh, Biden is bragging about this, but he says, you know, to, to marshal this deal, Israel will have to form a broad coalition uh, and to um, let go of the religious parties, let go of the right-wing parties and form a, co a broad-based coalition with Le Pen, who is out of his effing mind, uh, and uh, with um, uh, the centrist uh, party, whose head despises uh, Netanyahu. And then they would also have to commit to the two-state solution. They would have to commit to never building another settlement in, uh, in Jewish land. And on and on it goes to... Uh, to um, move out of and never again enter all of these concessions for normalization that the president would be able to deliver only if the president of the United States could intervene in Israel's politics and control it, as if the voters of Israel were irrelevant and only yeah. Biden mattered and that he could be the Neville <laughs> Chamberlain and sacrifice Israel to achieve peace in our time. It was one of the most preposterous proposals ever made, and yet Thomas Friedman is such a progressive, such a utter moron, that he published it as if it were news, if it were reality. Biden never corrected him. 
and the liberal press in Israel presents it as if, well, what's, what's Israel going to do if that happens? Well, Israel learned from the Oslo Accords. The leftists in Israel signed the Oslo Accords at the insistence of another liberal leftist in Bill Clinton. It was the dumbest thing the nation could ever have done. They set up the PLO to be a functioning government with its own little military arm, its schools, hospitals, everything to be an independent country. And what did they do? They taught their children to hate and kill Jews. What did they do? They became absolute parasites. What did they do? They still pay for slay. And they became so unpopular in the process, not because they were trying to destroy Israel, but because they were not violent enough that now the PA has a 80% disapproval rating, which is why they have not had elections and uh, and going on the second decade. And then Bush forced Israel to capitulate on Gaza and withdraw, and again with the support of Israel's exceedingly liberal high court and liberal politicos. And look what happened. Hamas hmm. rockets. And so they're at it again. Uh, and it is just astonishing how uh, how dumb they can be. You know, I saw an article today in my last item in the news. It's uh, something most people would overlook. Uh, DeSantis in, uh, in Florida... Uh, um, assigned, uh, he had got a choice uh, as Florida governor, to appoint a board member for uh, Disney uh, World. Uh, and his board member uh, ha- encouraged a curriculum that actually said, you know, we, we need to put things in context. And in context, there were uh, white slaves uh, among the first colonists. And so this liberal journalist gets all up in arms and says, oh, that's that's completely debunked and untrue and can you imagine somebody saying that that there were white slaves in America I went on and on about it do you know how long it takes to fact check that Uh, about five seconds write down uh, indentured servitude first Europeans in America you know Mm -hmm. what percentage of the Europeans that came to America that were slaves? Probably the majority. 30%. 30%, okay. 30%. An indentured servant is a slave. Nobody, by the way, becomes an indentured servant because, boy, I think that'd be a great lifestyle. That's what I want to choose. You know, somebody say, oh, that's not slavery. That's, you're voluntary. No, you're not. You're either in debt, you've done something, you have no hope, life is unlivable. Before you will... Give yourself to someone as a slave. There are no other options. 30%. But it didn't fit the liberal agenda. So they chose to ignore it. Kirk, you mentioned you were reading things in the news. What did you find that uh, was different than what I well, found? Nothing terribly different. I, I did find it really gem that I had never read before. And the civil, right before the Civil War, the freed slaves that uh, lived in South Carolina, they were they they held over five thousand slaves themselves. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so black <laughs> on black. Uh, that reminds me of uh, of General uh, uh, Lee, Robert E. Lee, uh, having all of his monuments yeah. taken down, having his home in Arlington confiscated uh, from him, uh, and being totally discredited. And yet he was opposed to slavery and never owned a slave. And Ulysses S. Grant is uh, on the U.S. currency, is revered as a great hero, has statues and uh, next to the Capitol on Washington, D.C., and he was an alcoholic and a slave order. Yep. It, you know, we, we have a monument, a shrine to Abraham Lincoln as this great emancipator. And oh, in yeah. the uh, Lincoln-Douglas debates, uh, Lincoln's yes. point of view was the only thing can be done with the blacks in America 
is to uh, send them off to concentration camps because they're not capable of living with civil people. He viewed them as unsalvageable savages. Yep. So, we have a real problem with the uh, the truth, and it is growing scarcer and scarcer with each passing day. Uh, uh, in fact, I have one other quick item in the news here, uh, uh, folks, is that, um, you know, yeah, I was returning in 10 years uh, with Dode. Uh, it's not a very long time away. And some people said, boy, that's, uh, that's awful fast. That doesn't seem credible. Uh, all I would have to remind you of uh, is, could you imagine the world being uh, as different as it became from uh, January to February of, of 2020 with the imposition of loss of freedoms and loss of livelihood, destruction of the economy mm-hmm. with uh, worldwide of COVID for, right. you know, a, a, a super contagious flu. Uh, and the fear porn that went along with it? No, I'm telling you, could you, have, could you imagine that the United States would work for uh, since 2002 to uh, start a proxy war against uh, Russia when they had more nuclear weapons than anyone else with no potential for resolution and that we would move towards that until we actually had our war and that we would destroy the U.S. economy and military and credibility worldwide. And the dollar? Yeah, would you, would you imagine that, uh, that those kind of things would have happened? So it is just 10 years away. And... I, Come to find out that if Yahweh were to delay, which he obviously not going to do, there wouldn't be any people to come back to. Do you know that mm-hmm. that uh, religious Jews in Israel are uh, intermarry with other religious Jews in Israel uh, at a rate of about 99.9 percentile? They never marry out of tribe, but there is no hope for any ultra-Orthodox uh, Jew in Israel or in the United States. Zero. They are never going to know Yahweh. They're never going to be part of the covenant family. Zero hope. So the only people that have any hope are the non-religious. Of the secular Jews in America, 70% are married non-Jews. Yes. So they're uh, denuding what it means to be ethnically Jewish which is all Yahweh cares about, at an exceedingly high rate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, by by seventy uh, percent in a generation. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? Mm-hmm. It is. So there wouldn't be anyone to come back to unless uh, unless he uh, uh, comes as he had promised ten years from now in year six thousand. Yeah. It has uh, been a. Uh, at least a week. It, it seems longer than that um, since we did the Q and A and we were last and uh, the 89th Psalm. Did we just take one week break from it? And because uh, maybe we did something in the interim, but um, I'm showing that the last uh, passage that we read from the most beautiful song ever written was the 24th uh, statement. It reads. Therefore, my steadfast commitment, this is God speaking, uh, and he is speaking of his son, Dode David. Therefore, my steadfast commitment to the truth, imuna ani. That means my trustworthiness, my unrelenting honesty, the realization that I'm reliable and dependable, my unchanging Mm -hmm. nature, my... I uh, never contradicting myself. It is from Imun, my endearing truth, and Amon, my support and willingness to confirm and uphold that which is consistent and verifiable. I share all of this to uh, help uh, Kirk out because our friend Kirk has uh, has volunteered <laughs> for one of the uh, the uh, most uh, demanding of all projects. Uh, which is to be the ultimate word sleuth uh, for the uh, Hebrew text and to take the most important Hebrew names, verbs, nouns, um, and uh, figures of speech, adverbs, adjectives, prepositions, if you will, 
uh, stems and moods and conjugations and create a glossary uh, for those who, A, either want to translate some on their own, uh, or B, uh, want a fast way to look up the full uh, meaning of a word. Emuna is a, uh, is a great example. Yes. So therefore, my steadfast commitment to the truth and my unwavering love, determined devotion, and enduring favoritism, chesed, my commitment to a loving relationship, to generosity and to kindness, are with him. In my name, his light will radiate and enlighten through his brilliant horn, which will be lifted up, raised on high, and exalted. There is a tremendous difference between the actual God that revealed the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms and the fake gods of the New Testament and uh, Quran, uh, Book of Mormon, and uh, Dianetics and Scientology, and, uh, and the plethora of gods in Hinduism. And that is that the actual God never contradicts himself. Never. Never says anything that's not true. Uh, and you read the Christian New Testament, I mean, all, every sentence is, contradicts another sentence in it. Mm -hmm. But even with this enormous swath of information revealed through 40 prophets over a thousand years, God never once contradicts himself, never once makes a mistake. And he says, all of that, all of my steadfast commitment to be trustworthy and reliable and to convey the truth along with my unwavering love, my devotion, my sense of favoritism, which is a really important part of Chesed, are with him, masculine, singular, identified throughout this psalm, his toad, David. Mm -hmm. Then he says, in my name, Yahweh's name, He's going to be brilliant. He's going his he's going to be luminous. He's going to enlighten. He's even going to have a brilliant horn. Uh, Karen is an interesting word because the insight in Karen is that the first time that it is used in the Torah, uh, it is exceedingly uh, revealing and important. And as you're trying to translate, uh, and your glossary will do a great job of this, uh, Kirk. And you realize that the first time it's used is uh, Abraham and Yishak have gone to Mount Moriah, Moriah, a three-day uh, walk uh, through up to Moriah. They've got a couple of witnesses that have gone uh, with them. And they've gone there to make uh, a, a Passover sacrifice. And... Uh, Yahweh says, no, 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 don't, you're, you're not going to do this with your son. I am going to provide the lamb. And, of course, he did with his son, Tod. And then we are told that Abraham looked up, and what he noticed was a ram caught in the thickets by his karen, radiating horns. Mm -hmm. That karen is this karen. Exactly the same individual. This is the kind of prophecy when you know what the words mean and you, and you can make the connections take you from knowing to understanding. God is speaking of that exact same Karen, the radiant, luminous uh, sense of power and authority. That's what horns are for, and also ability to convey a message. They also signify a king. But these are illuminated, and they radiate light. They enlighten. That makes that lamb, that ram, that Yahweh provided on Moriah for Abraham and Yishak to confirm the covenant, the same one that he is showing his singular devotion to, and his ultimate steadfast commitment to be reliable regarding. 
and he's saying that individual bearing my name will be lifted up, raised on high, and exalted. It is why Doe did this. Yes, it was the greatest, most magnanimous sacrifice in human history. Courageous. For him to volunteer to suffer under the most diabolical regime man had ever known. Imperial Rome. The most horrific form of death and torture ever devised. Crucifixion. And that was after having his skin ripped off his body, being flayed alive by the flagellum with the metal-tipped uh, ends of that whip that pulled all the soft tissue off his back and legs and abdomen. And then he agreed, volunteered, desired the idea of being laden with our guilt and carrying it into Sheol and enduring matzah and Sheol to perfect us so that he deposited all of that guilt there and never to be see, seen again. He volunteered for that torture because he knew it was important for him to be lifted up, raised on high, and exalted. Doe doesn't have an ego. And you read what he has to say. Ego does not one of his failings. He's very much like his father that way. <laughs> But Dode knows, no, not his earthly father. His earthly father was a dimwit. But his heavenly father. His heavenly father is, is, uh, is not the least bit arrogant or boastful. Um, Dode knew that if he wasn't lifted up, raised on high, and exalted, there was no way for him to lead the Israelites. I'm sorry for... Those who are listening, you are our target audience. I love you dearly. But you're irascible. You're impossible. You know, do the waters of Mirabah ring a bell? Moshe was the finest of men. Selfless. Devoted. Always willing to risk it all for the benefit of his people. And yet they turned on him. And Dode says, listen, if in 40 years... They wanted to kill him, and he was the best of men. And unless we do something really magnificent, I don't have a prayer being the king of these people for all eternity, even if you choose the best of them. So Dote realized there was a way to be sufficiently esteemed that he could be respected enough to be able to be an effective leader for all eternity over Israel, and that was to be their savior. And the way to do that was to volunteer, to serve as the Pesach Gael, the Passover lamb, and then to fulfill matzah. And that's not only what he did, that's what God is saying here. That is exactly why these terms were chosen. As I have shared, Dode, David, is like Yahweh in many ways, both passionate, both have an unwavering commitment to the truth, and both are exceedingly great without ego. They're both immensely loving. I mean, Dode may have been among the most loving individuals ever. In fact, it was his emotion that most often got him in trouble. In fact, I would say it was his emotions that always got him in trouble. <laughs> Not only with Bathsheba, but with Absalom, uh, with um, uh, even the uh, the concerns when God gave him three choices and said, you know, we, we've got to resolve this problem. And he chose poorly because of, of an emotional response. He, he was crippled by emotions because he was too emotional. Um uh, we, we, we did a Q&A uh, uh, some time ago where I mentioned that uh, Dode was, uh, um, was amphibious as it relates to, uh, to lovers. 
he could uh, be in uh, land and in, in sea. He, uh, he uh, loved a man in addition to zealously loving women. And so this is a man that, uh, that knew a lot about love uh, and was willing to do anything for it. So by looking at one, Yahweh, we see the other, Dod. By looking at Dod, we see Yahweh. Seen together, they encapsulate the Torah and they emulate the covenant. Now, it's true that Dod was flawed and Yahweh was not. But to the degree that it's possible for God to be a lovable rascal, a lovable rogue, uh, and, and that's, uh, that's, that's stretching it, but, you know, the, uh, the Harrison Ford character uh, in, uh, in uh, Star Wars, um, Han Solo, to be the lovable rogue that uh, in the end does all the right things uh, and uh, risks it all for the right cause, um, uh, that's Dode. Oh, you know, Dode's a billion times brighter and more courageous, and he's the real deal, not an actor. But for Yahweh to love this man beyond all others, to call him his son, anoint him as Messiah, to call him his firstborn, to uh, uh, inspire him as a prophet, to be at his side on every battle, uh, for Yahweh to build a home for him uh, and a throne for him, uh, to work with him to fulfill the seven most important days in human history. There's something special there that says that the way Dode is resonates with Yahweh. Now, I am one of those who does not believe that opposites attract. I think that it is common things, common values, common interests that cause us to be attracted to one another. And, and so I, I have every reason to suspect that to the degree it's possible, you know, I realize God's perfect and he is infinitely beyond human comparison, but the closest paradigm to him would be Dode. And Dode is a lovable rogue. Their relationship made it possible for us to understand and thereby experience Yahweh's enduring love. And the fact that Yahweh plays favorites. When Yahweh said this about himself, and then he said what he said about Dod in this statement, he, of course, destroyed the basis of the Christian religion. Since God is unwavering in his commitment to the truth, he could not have inspired the contradictory message found in the Christian New Testament. And keep in mind, that message is polar opposite of the Torah. It condemns yes. the Torah to survive. It annuls almost everything that God said. It takes every promise that God made to his son, for example, and transfers it to another. It takes every promise that God said to his people and transfers it to another. It makes God out to be a complete and utter liar. Yes. A consistent God, a truthful God, can therefore not be the author of the Christian New Testament. It's impossible. If it conveys the same message as that found in the Torah, it becomes superfluous. But if its message differs, as it does, for it to be true, the statement God just made must be false. And since God stated that his enduring commitment to the truth and to mercy were both with Dode, one leads to the other, completely negating the Christian notion of salvation through faith. That's just the facts. If you want to be a believer, go about your business. All good things occur in Yahweh's name, from love to enlightenment, from mercy to being converted into light and thus becoming immortal and perfected. Also interesting, Yahweh told Abraham, uh, as we talked 
that he was going to provide the lamb, and we did find there that the Korin horns of radiant light appeared on the summit of Mount Moriah as the standard for the firstborn, the only begotten son, as God referred to Yishak pursuant to Abraham, just as Dode fills that role for Yahweh. So, clearly, Dode is being symbolically portrayed as having been there um, a thousand years before he was even born. And you might say, oh, come on, you know, that's, that's getting to be hooey again. You know, you're, there was a uh, uh, question, I don't know if we actually tried to answer it or uh, or not, uh, but uh, um, uh, that was on the question and answer for last week. It says, you know, you talked, when you're translating uh, the book of Daniel, and there are three, two prophets and a witness. Uh, the witness introduces the prophets and uh, and helps to point um, Daniel in the right direction. And the description of, of Dode's Herald, if you will, describes the work that we're doing. And so it, it reads as if um, 2,600 years uh, before I was born, I was there serving the king and the Messiah as his herald, which is my job. And so one of the people say, you know, how is that even possible to do? How would it be possible for Dode to have been there as representing that lamb uh, a thousand years before he was born? Uh, the answer for that is that time is not the same thing for us as it is for Yahweh. It does not move right. the same way. He can, he can uh, maneuver in it. Uh, time simply is for God. He can see our past and our present, actually witness it. Uh, he can see our future uh, 2,000 years before it happens and report what he has witnessed in our past. That's how prophecy works. Yeah. And so it is possible for him to take a soul and take it back in time and forward in time. How do you think that uh, the Jawa inspired his prophets to describe future events if he didn't take them to the future, then bring them back to the past? And if he can do that, why can't he take them into the past? And time is going to be maneuverable in both directions. Now, it's interesting when we talk about time this way. It's quite a conundrum mm -hmm. because... While we're still in this universe, before Yahweh in year 7,000, Yah uh, creates a new universe for us, and we're all spiritual beings, um, that in this particular universe, there will be restrictions on us going back in time. We can mm -hmm. go forward in time all we want. We can explore in the here and now all we want. But when we go back in time, there have to be restrictions, because it's one thing to observe, it's another thing to interact. And if we were to interact, let's say that we, we saw World War II uh, beginning and Adolf Hitler rise to power and say, well, I can save 50 million souls by taking this guy out. Well, that has such a profound effect on what follows that the world doesn't turn out to be as uh, it would have been, and it, uh, it creates uh, conundrums that are unanswerable. So you, you can't do it. And the very fact that the – that time led us to what we are experiencing now means that no one went back and uh, and changed it. Otherwise, we wouldn't have this reality. Right. Um, so it is possible, though, to go back as a as a witness. You just can't go back as a doer. I mean, uh, yep. Dode would have gone forward in time to uh, explain this, but someone like myself would go back. And in this particular case, um, for, uh, for Dode to understand this, he probably was taken back in time and witnessed it. These are very fascinating ways to, to come to understand what uh, God is uh, doing. And, of course, Yahweh was sim symbolically portraying what he would accomplish with Dod, his son, 2,000 years later, 40 Yobel, to be precise, on the same mountain. 
And it was there that as the exemplar of the covenant and the Zeroah, the sacrificial lamb, Dode offered, in fact, he desired the opportunity to fulfill Pesach and Matzah leading to Bukotam and Shabuwa. One after the next, every word of each declaration contains a treasure of relevant insights when we're dealing with the 89th Mizmor. The same is true with the uh, uh, the statements that we're going to share next. In fact, each of the next three is exceedingly rich. Uh, I think they're awesome individually. They're exceptionally collectively. Uh, Dode's status with God is both exceedingly special. That's why he's called the set-apart one, and secure. This is Yahweh's next declaration. He himself will call out to me, and he will welcome me, announcing, you are my father. I also will appoint and make him Bakor Ani my firstborn. The Elon, highest and uppermost, as if Almighty God, in comparison to the kings and rulers of the earth. For all eternity, I will keep watch over him, paying close attention to him. My unwavering love, my unrenting, unrelenting devotion, enduring affection, genuine favoritism, in addition to my family-oriented covenant, Wabareth, Ani, are truthfully and reliably presented and established through him, and they are verifiable and enduring with him. Mismore 8928. I would say that, uh, that there are at least 10 statements in the 89th Mismore where if we were given a uh, 100 shows of an hour and a half length, that we could not exhaust the insights uh, and the relevance of those statements. This is, one of, this is one of them. So... It is one thing for Yahweh to say, Dode is my son. That would make Dode the son of God. Rabbi said, oh, he was never given that title. What do you think Bakor Ani, my firstborn, means? <laughs> His words are not complicated. Bakor, no. when, yeah, you know, you're able to translate Bakor when it's talking about uh, uh, the plague, the last plague for Pharaoh uh, on the demonstration of, of Pesach Passover. And, you know, that would be the firstborn son. Same word. Yep. So Pharaoh's son died. Put most the, uh, the thirds. Son Predeceived him. Taken. No explanation in the annals of history. One day he's alive, the next day and he's the heir to the throne, next day he's gone. So no one has a problem saying, well, that's that's his son. When Yahweh speaks of humans having uh, sons, the Bakor is the firstborn. Special rights. So when Yahweh says, Bakor Ani, he's speaking... I will appoint him, I will make him, I will offer him, I will give him as Bakor Ani, my firstborn. My firstborn son. And it goes beyond just saying that he is God's son. It says that he is the firstborn and he is Almighty God. Yeah. Well, that certainly heck solves the the next rabbinic uh, problem, which they say, oh, it can't be you know a person uh, can't be God's son because they're interspecies. 
They're different species. <laughs> what, what, what do you? Th- have you ever looked at the word covenant? Right here. Uh, covenant is is based on Bayeth. It's Bayeth with a person in the middle of it. Bayeth is is Bayeth family and home with a person in the middle of it, a Rosh. It's not hard to figure out. So if God's going to have a family relationship, then what do you think that Bukotam? It's a Moed Mikre. Bukotam. It's based upon Bukor, firstborn. It's plural. Firstborn children. It's God's covenant. He's saying... I'm going to have firstborn children. Mm-hmm. So don't you think that God's capable of saying, well, I created life. I created all of these different life forms. I gave them the Salmas, uh, uh, Nefesh's souls, and I gave humans and the Salma so that they could think uh, and relate to me that he's capable of taking us yes. from being mortal, physical, corporeal beings and making us Light energy, spiritual, like himself. Yeah. Sure. Cool. And what's, yes. what's the point if he says this whole thing was created for the covenant if we don't become sons and daughters of God? Why would he call the third Moed Mikre Bukotam? Firstborn children. It's like they don't want you to be a father. Right. Not theirs. And, and in this case, he is saying, son of God. Bakor Ani uh, Elion. My firstborn, who is God Almighty. Elion. Highest yep. and uppermost. Almighty God. What happens if you become God's child, his kid? His family, like him. You, you, you're. you're God. That's just all there is to it. He's Yahweh is saying that that as the inheritance right of being chosen as his firstborn, that Dode becomes essentially God. It makes sense. Same yes. same business as his father. Yep. Yes. What's the you know, son, this whole notion that God is uh, is so superior that he wants to lord over us and he created us to worship him and to fear him and to bow down before him and uh, and plead with him and pray to him and praise him and worship him and all this sort of thing is just poppycock. Yeah. God would be disgusting to have created an inferior being to worship him. He'd be a narcissist. He'd be psychotic. He'd be sadistic. It is, it is repulsive to think that a superior being would create an inferior being to worship. Right. No one in their right mind would want that. But if you're a superior being and you can enjoy a family, you can go from being alone to doing everything together and experiencing everything life has to offer and the universe has to offer with your sons and daughters, and you have the opportunity to raise them so that you can enlighten them and empower them and enrich them, every moment of your existence is rewarding. Right. Everything that you do for them is enjoyable for you. So this is the whole concept. God is speaking of Dode as his firstborn, and and as God's firstborn, he is Elio, essentially God. And that's the gift. Nathan, when Yashaya, my my favorite prophet, and I always have a little trepidation in saying that because... Um, uh, Dode is uh, is uh, you know I serve Dode. He's my boss. Um, you know it's uh, uh, that that's the job description. Uh, being a Bashar herald uh, on Teruah 
uh, you're working for Dode. Um, and by working for Dode, you're working for his people, Yisrael. And if you're working for his people, you're serving the big guy, Yahweh. It's just the, the, the way this relationship works. And when you recognize um, what Yashaya, uh, my personal favorite prophet, uh, had to say um, about Dode in the um, ninth chapter, sixth and seventh statements. And he says, you know, a, a child is going to be born. A son will be Nathan, given. Mm -hmm. You want to understand what he's saying here? Look at that. He even says what his name's going to be. His name's going to be Dote. He says he's going to be a Gabor, courageous, competent. He says he's going to be a witness on behalf of the Father. All of these things. And so he's saying here, not only am I going to appoint him, he is my gift. So he's not just my son and therefore the son of Elon God, gift to you. I'm giving him to you. I'm supporting his desire to serve as the Pesach El, the Passover lamb, the Zeroah, and to fulfill matzah, leading to firstborn children, Bekorim. That's my gift to you, Israel. Yes, he's my son, and we're working together. And this is our ultimate gift. They're powerful, powerful words. And he's saying that, that his firstborn, Bakor, is who is being given to us, is not only essentially God, by comparison to all of the rulers of the earth, he is God. For all eternity, I will keep watch over him, paying very close attention to him. Why? Because Yahweh was his father. And he enjoys Dode's company. He wants to spend eternity in the presence and company of his son. And he's not going to do it until, well, as Paul said, until Jebus. They'll do it forever. No replacement. There's no substitution. There's no, oh, I'm tired of him, next. Oh, I'm going to, he's dead and buried. Worm rot. Hey, do you see what the Romans did to him? No way. No, forever. And this is very appealing because as with Dode, as with us. Right. And this means that for all eternity, Yahweh is going to keep watch over us. Because he is the exemplar of the covenant, which means that as, the, as he receives the benefits of the covenant, as he receives the lion's share, I was translating a passage the other day, Dode is actively sharing what he has been given. Right. My unwavering love, enduring devotion, affection, genuine favoritism are with him. Now, we'll finish that thought in a moment, but here's what you you need to have an appreciation of. Mm -hmm. The world is wont to, we had a guest last night that even had a fit over this, uh, that the God of the Old Testament is wrathful, you know. And I said, um, you have a daughter, don't you? And he said, yeah, I have a daughter. So uh, he goes to local school here. What if uh, one of the, the uh, teachers in the school abused your daughter, harmed her materially? Would uh, you rearrange their, uh, that uh, gentleman's teeth and perhaps take his uh, frontal organ and, and tuck it neatly in his uh, backside? Would you be violent with it? Yes, I would defend my daughter. Thank you. Okay. So Yahweh has a family. Family is Yisrael. His family is the covenant. 
if you abuse his children, and think about abuse. What did the Romans, who became the Roman Catholics, do to his son? They crucified him. Oh, yeah. They didn't have to. You know, the, the, to be the Passover lamb, you can have an innocent and merciful passage. No, they crucified him. They tortured him. And then, uh, after doing that, then they, they stole from him all of the honor and respect that he earned by doing this for us. And then they replaced him with a myth. And then he did this for his people, and they went and condemned his people, accusing them of killing him when it was just the opposite. And then they tortured his people all the way to the Holocaust. Now, you don't think that as a loving and merciful father that God has every reason to respond and will respond? I'd say so. Oh, sorry, don't, don't bring that up again. It's the only loving thing to do. And God's love for Dode as his firstborn and for every covenant member is eternal. Which means his protection of those people is also eternal. And sometimes mm -hmm. people get uh, mouthy with me and, and I, I'd say, you know, I, you don't want to do that. This is, this is not a good life choice for you. Because if you take it to the next step and you were to harm me some way, you're going to have to deal with a force that you don't want to deal with. <laughs> it's true with every covenant member. Yep. So my unwavering love and in unrelenting devotion, my genuine favoritism, addition to my family-oriented covenant, Wabarath, are truthfully presented and reliably established through him. So Yahweh's relationship with Dode, which we can read about, uh, Yahweh says more about Dode, his life, his emotions, his thinking, his prophetic words, his advice, uh, every aspect of his life, including his fulfillment of the seven Moed Mikre, including his return as king of kings. Now it tells us more about Dode than anyone else. I mean, one of the most revealing passages of, of all passages is, is 2 Samuel 7, where uh, God said, what do you mean you're talking about building me a house? Oh, you you building me a house? Hey, I'm the dad. It's my job to build a house for you. <laughs> uh, it is so revealing the nature of their relationship. And so God is telling us, if you want to understand the covenant, examine my relationship with Dode. He's the exemplar of it. Then he goes one step further and said, the covenant is established through him. You know, we were the first, well, at least 2,500 years and maybe longer, mm -hmm. to recognize that, the fi that there are five benefits of the covenant and all five benefits are established and conveyed, made available to us by the fulfillment of the first four Moed Mikre. In your 4,000 Yah. They are Pesach eternal life, perfection by having our guilt removed and taken into Sheol on Matzah, being adopted into Yahweh's covenant family by uh, firstborn children, Bukurim, and being empowered and enriched on Shabuah. Who fulfilled the first four Mikra? No. So who brought us the benefits of the covenant. Toad. Toad. Of course. He so he's not it. only the exemplar of the covenant, he is the means through which the covenant's benefits were established. And those covenant benefits provide unwavering love, unrelenting devotion, genuine favoritism for all eternity. Mismore, 89... 28. Why is it over the 3,000 years that this has been available that there isn't a single Jew whose language ought to have been Hebrew? You know, it, it is for many now. That not a single one put these pieces together and said this is the most magnificent revelation of all time. This is affirmation 
that Dode is our Messiah, that he's the son of God. Not that other guy that the Christians are promoting. This is the real McCoy. This is the Messiah. This is the son of God. He is the Passover lamb. He fulfilled matzah. He's our savior. He is, in essence, almighty God in our presence. That's what this says. There's no dispute that the 89th Mizmor was inspired by Yahweh. It's prophetic. There's no dispute that it has been available to Jews for 3,000 years. Why is it that not one acknowledges any of these things that we're saying? How is it in light of this that Christians go off and promote the idea that a misnomer, somebody that never lived, a, a name that has no meaning, purpose, relevance whatsoever, was afforded all of these accolades that were given to Dode, and yet that individual is never named in any prophecy? And it says this about Dode. Forever. That he is the embodiment of the covenant. That he is the means to the covenant. That he is, in essence, almighty God. That he is God's son. And you're going to ignore all of that? You're carrying it around in your book? You're going to say, no, 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 not, not true. But that's the same God that, you know, inspired our... Our Paul to contradict him. So, what I Paul say? I mean, how stupid do you have to be to be religious? Whether it's Judaism or Christianity, in light of this. I laugh, but it's true. It's no. so easy to see the truth. Mm-hmm. Second only to the introductory proclamations that Yahweh made at the inception of Dode's song, um, the three pronouncements made in 89.28 are as important as anything that you and I will ever encounter. He himself will call out to me and welcome me, announcing, you are my father. I also will bestow him as a gift appointing and making him Bakor, Ani, my firstborn, as Elion, Almighty God, the highest and uppermost in comparison to the kings and rulers of the earth. For all eternity, I will keep watch over him, paying very close attention to him, focusing on him. My unwavering love, unrelenting devotion, enduring favoritism, and genuine affection. In addition to my family-oriented covenant relationship, are truthfully presented and reliably established, verified and enduring through him. If I were to ask you what's the single most important thing in the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms, what would be your answer? This psalm. I would say that's in the top five, but nope, I don't think that's the single most important, that Dode is God's son. It's top. It's in the top five. I would say the covenant instructions is the most changed. Yeah, the covenant. The existence yeah. of the covenant. It's uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the rules for admission and the benefits for the admittees. Mm-hmm. Um single most important subject. I mean, once God says, okay, I created the heavens and earth. That was really cool. Did a nice job. I thought I'd tell you about it. Uh, and uh, uh, and then, you know, some things didn't turn out uh, quite as well as I had hoped in Eden. But I'm going to explain to you what Eden's all about because we had a, I had a great time in Eden. And and uh, and then, you know, well, things didn't turn out quite the way that we had hoped. And, and so I had to, to start all anew. So I, I, I gave uh, I gave a portion of the earth a really a really good scrubbing and bath. And uh, that all led to the story of uh, Abraham and Sarah and the covenant. And I had seven meetings with them, and boy, we, we, I don't think there's any subject in the entirety of the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms that receives as much dialogue 
as the formation of the covenant. Yeah. It, it's, it, so we're, we're introduced. We say this is uh, what, what I did. This is who I am. This is what I created. Uh, this is uh, my, uh, my idea of the ideal situation in Eden. Uh, this is what I can't tolerate. This is why I rebooted the system, gave it a good bath. And here we are. This is the, uh, the covenant. This is why I chose uh, Abraham and Sarah, and uh, these are the conditions, and these are the benefits. The single most important thing that there there is in the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms. And now Yahweh is telling us that it was made possible based upon his relationship and his work with his son, Dode. And that Dode, by doing this, became God. Not just God, the Son of God. And that if we want to understand the covenant, he's the exemplar of it. If we want to benefit of it, he provided those benefits. And as I said, we're the first in 2,500 years to explain that the five benefits of the covenant are delivered through the first four Moed Mikre, and we're also the first to explain that God's son, Dode, fulfilled those four Moed Mikre. Oh, for sure. I've not seen it no. anywhere else. No, not not in, not in 2,500 years. Not from God's people, look. not from the secular, not from the sectarian. Nowhere. Nope. The greatest treasure in human history. No, to say that we're the first to share this with you, sounds like we're uh, we're gloating, but no, it's not. I didn't reveal it's it. Not at all. It's right here. I, just dealing with what the words say. Mm-hmm. It was just the first to read them and convey what they are revealing to us and what it means to your life. Uh, the lives of um, of Jews changed appreciably um, when uh, they decided that they would be cantankerous and rebellious with uh, Moshe and didn't go directly into the promised land but wandered around the wilderness for 40 years and, and just became persona non grata. And it changed again when they refused to go into the promised land and then when they didn't follow God's instructions, when they did go into the promised land, things changed and became worse for them. And then uh, finally, they, they're there, and, uh, and they say, you know, we don't like God's plan anymore, and we want a uh, king like the Goyim nations. That didn't turn out very good for them either. Mm-hmm. And then God gives them and says, if you want a leader, then I'm going to give you the exemplary, uh, an exemplary leader. And he introduces us to go uh, next to the formation of the covenant, probably the, the most talked about relationship uh, in ancient history. Uh, from that point, though, uh, his son starts off good and then goes bad, uh, again, uh, emotion. He, intellectually, he was fine. Emotionally, he was not. And uh, Israel falls apart. You have the Assyrians, and that was bad. And then you have the Babylonians, and that was bad. And that, then you had the Greeks, and, well, that was, uh, that was bad. And, and uh, it just goes on and on. Oh. After the Greeks came the Romans, and the Romans attacked them three times. Can't be any worse than the Romans. And no. and Israel actually aided and abetted its own demise with the uh, the Romans. Um, and then after the uh, the Romans and and uh, there was the Roman Catholics, and there was no one that that abused God's people for a longer period of time than did uh, the Roman Catholics, uh, leading all the way to the uh, the Holocaust. It's It's been a, a rough go. And the single most egregious mistake, crime, that was created, uh, that was perpetrated on the Jews is actually the responsibility of the Jews. And this is, uh, I could name three of them, and you could uh, debate which one was the worst, and they're all 
caused by juice. Mm -hmm. uh, the first of those is when Paul and Peter and Luke were creating Christianity and creating this Dionysian uh, caricature that was given all of, uh, of Dode David's accolades and achievements uh, uh, to conceive this Jesus Christ and therefore Christianity. Uh, all Jews had to say is, have you guys ever read the 89th Psalm? <laughs> Take a read of it and, and then get back to me on this because it's not possible. And had they simply done that, said, have you ever read the 22nd Mismore where Dode talks in first person about his fulfillment of Pesach, Matzah, and Bakudim leading to Shabua, and he speaks of Roman crucifixion a thousand years in advance of it occurring, you know, 800 years before Roma even existed? Come on, folks. You, know, you may want to think this through and, and get back to us on it. They could have stopped Christianity. And had they stopped Christianity, think of, of how different the world would be. There'd be no shuttles. There'd be no ghettos. There'd been no harassment and, and being accused of being God killers, yeah. being dehumanized, uh, being the object of all those conspiracies. All of that was because they were asleep at the switch and didn't refute the birth of Christianity by citing the 89th and 22nd Mismores. Simple as that. What was the second most egregious act? Well, when Rabbi Akiba decided that he would respond to this growth of Christianity by playing the same game. If you had one false messiah, why not another one? And so his false messiah would vie with the Christian false messiah, and we'd have the false messiah wars. Well, what happened? So Rome, Rome responded. They crucified Jews, and the ones they didn't crucify, they hauled off into slavery, beginning the diaspora. The father of rabbinic Judaism caused the diaspora, leading to the Holocaust, and he did so by foisting a false messiah to counter the false messiah of Christianity. Jews did it to themselves. And I'm going to give you a third. Rabbi Muhammad grew up Muhammad. In, uh, and Petra was uh, wallowing around in, in, uh, in his own malarkey, full of himself. But all he had to go with was uh, to copy the Hanif poetry from Yemen, to happened to be Jews. And that became his first, like, 80 Quran surahs. And it was just regurgitated poetry from the uh, the Hanifs, these Jews in uh, in Yemen. So then his uh, his peers get the best of him and say, okay, okay, we we get you. You're being disruptive, but you know we've got lots of gods, uh, we've got lots of uh, of leaders, we've got lots of women. We'll give you the prettiest women. We'll give you some money. We'll give you some uh, 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 gods to call your own. You acknowledge us, play with us, go along with our scheme. And we'll do these things for you. And Muhammad said, hey, that's a pretty good deal. That's really what I wanted in the first place. Muhammad agrees to it. Uh, Abu Bakr, who had uh, sacrificed his six-year-old daughter uh, to have sex with this 53-year-old man, said, wait a minute. You know, I gave you my daughter. You told me we're, we're, the, we're the founders of a monotheistic religion. And now you're worshiping uh, the pagan gods of, uh, of the Kaaba. What's the deal? So, you know, uh, Muhammad said, well, I really like the little girl, so... I'll come clean and say that, you know, all of Allah's messengers speak on behalf of Satan. It's called the satanic verses. And then he was mocked, so he, he had his mythical wild Barak ride up to, uh, to Jerusalem where he uh, entered the, uh, the temple and met with all the Hebrew bigwigs, not knowing that the temple had been destroyed by the Romans many, many centuries prior. So he is now round out of, uh, of what was Petra, uh, then renamed uh, or moved to, for political reasons, Mecca later, uh, and went to Yathrib, where, where the yeah. Jews lived. Yathrib, that's your first clue. It was 75% uh, Jewish, this community. And when he arrived, the first thing he said is, 
<laughs> that false messiah thing, that's really worked uh, pretty well. You had, uh, you know, Christianity with a false messiah. He didn't actually say this, but you're just thinking it out loud. Yeah, Christianity with a false messiah. You got uh, uh, Judaism starting with a false messiah. Ha! <laughs> I want to play that same card. I'm the messiah. Yeah, the Jews didn't buy it. They said, okay, but, you know, there's a money-making opportunity here. We can make you look good. We can make you – we really know all about creating false messiahs. We can do this with you. And they started selling him uh, Talmud recitals, which he turned into the Quran. And everything that's even remotely religious and credible sounding in the Quran is a bastardized version of, uh, of a Quran recital, which the Quran and Hadith acknowledge that the Jews of Yathrib sold to Muhammad. Had they not done so, right. there would have been no Quran. There would have been no Islam. There would have been no jihadist. There'd been no Fakistinians. No place known as Fakistan. None of this would have happened. Wouldn't it be a single Islamic country today? No Iran, for example. And a hundred percent of the blame for Muhammad being able to pull mm -hmm. this off is Jews selling, rabbis selling Muhammad Talmud stories. The three most egregious acts in the history of Jews, all perpetrated by Jews. And this one is the first and most egregious of them. The failure to acknowledge that Dode is the Messiah, that he is the Son of God, and that he is the Zeroah, the sacrificial lamb, who fulfilled Pesach, Matzah, and Bakura. And that this is the doorway to life, the means to redemption and perfection, and to be adopted into God's family. It's the single greatest chapter of the greatest story ever told. And to this day, other than those who read the Yada Yahweh series and listen to this program, no one knows. You know, speaking of no one knows, uh, uh, D, you had um, a, uh, a person write about uh, a, a, as a question. You know, how come you uh, you don't know? Some people say uh, that uh, Teru is going to be fulfilled in 2027, and and you know, others say that it's going to be in uh, 2026. And and uh, Greg seems to think it's uh, 2029. Uh, you know, all the other dates were known. It's Yahweh's. Uh, 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 position to have everything be known for certain, how come you don't know? Yep. And I was polite in my answer, but I, I'm not going to be polite now. You were. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to be now. Okay. None of it was known. Uh, until <laughs> I invested the time using the tool that Yahweh speaks of vociferously, which is to yada and bien, know, and then make the connections to understand. No one knew. It's true. They didn't know. They didn't know the time that God's going to return. So you say, well, these things are known for certain. You can give me the exact minute of the exact day. Yeah, because I figured it out. God gave us the clues, and I figured it out, and I shared it with you, and now many people know. I've shared with you that is absolutely and right. what God said about Teruah. And you're yeah. you're saying that that's not adequate, but the others are, and that it was uh, it's Yahweh's nature for it to be known? Oh, yeah? How? <laughs> I know that nobody makes... else knows because I, I worked on this timeline for years. Before I even read Yada Yahweh, I knew about the Shemitah and the Yobel. And they called it Jubilee Years. Nobody in the world has it right but you. No. I have it's, it's it. this practice. It's it. Now, you know, um, clearly I'm cheating. Uh, as I told my <laughs> friend that came over uh, last night, I said, you know, uh, I, you know it, it, was, it was a profound awakening and very uncomfortable at first. When I went from being Yada... Um, a pseudonym and therefore anonymous yeah. to being 
Craig Wynn, the, uh, the Choter, to being the Knacker and Knackery, to being the Bashar, to being the Cole voice, to being the Malak messenger, to being the Zoroa. That transformation, that, that day that I was trying to study the meaning, doing what you're going to do here, Kirk, which is to track down the meaning of difficult words. A difficult word was Zoroa. And I was doing it the old-fashioned way. I looked up every place where Zeroa was used in the entire Torah, Prophets, and Psalms. And I came to the last two. And the second to last is this prophecy in Yashaya 53 that is introduced after telling us that there's going to be, in the previous chapter, there's going to be a Bashar who's going to be the coal voice that is going to herald the truth to God's people in the last days. And then it begins by saying, so who is this guy that has figured out who the Zoroa are? Yeah, I and I'm saying, oh, boy. Oh, boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. <laughs> this is not looking anonymous here. And then I had to go look up the the last use of, of Zoroa. It's probably the last uh, chronologically, uh, too, because of the time that it was written. But certainly the last uh, that was in the lexicons as I was tra- chasing it down. And that happens to be when Solomon gave the, uh, the speech on Mount Moriah <laughs> at the moment that he was dedicating the Temple on the Mount. And it, it speaks about the recognition of Yahweh's name, which we were the first to promote uh, correctly. Yeah. Uh, the recognition of Doe's special place that he is a Gabor and uh, and that he is the lead person in, in this story. And, of course, the Zoroa, that uh, he is the sacrificial lamb. And it calls this ind- individual a Nakri, which means Nakar is observant foreigner with a Nakri. It's my observant foreigner. And all of the things that he's going to say and that he's going to write and how important it's going to be, and then I go back and say, well, wait a minute, was that whole story about this choder, it's a productive sucker, a, a, uh, a secondary branch, and, and now I realize, okay, so there's a burden here. I've gone from everything is gravy, everything is the cherry on top of the cake, anything I do is considered uh, wonderful because I have no responsibility. This is just all plus <laughs> to being given the biggest responsibility of our time. In fact, the biggest responsibility in the last 2,500 years. Yes. And my, my world turned upside down. I mean, it went from this is a fun little project, I'm enjoying this, to, oh, my God, I don't want to disappoint God. What if I do a lousy job and then I have to look at Dodes and say, I'm sorry, I failed. Hmm. And I wanted to go play golf. No, it, it, all of a sudden I went from... This was something I did five days a week, and I, I did, you know, eight uh, hours a day or so to now I'm doing it seven days a week, and I'm doing it 14 hours a day. My, my wife feeds me in my chair as I translate and do this because it changed profoundly. Now, I'm not complaining. It's a, what a wonderful situation. But when you're, you're dealing with that, all of a sudden you say, oh, my. Yep. And now, now this is serious. Eternity is going to be shaped by what we do together. And then you read back to the presentation of the Choder and, uh, and Yeshia 11, and you're brought back down to earth. Okay, so not much to work with, so I want to give you seven spirits. Dode only needed one. You're going to need seven. So <laughs> you're, you're reading this, okay, so I, we really don't have... I, I can't take any credit for any of this because it is all being supplied. So now you know why there are a thousand unique insights that you're hearing here, that you read here, that are no place else. It's what God intended. And the reason he doesn't want this to be anonymous is there's too much writing on it. He's invested too much in this. And he knows that it all comes down to this simple realization. Over the past 6,000 years, there has been a battle for human souls. 
uh, the serpent, Hasatan, uh, came off the walls as a uh, cherub in the Garden of Eden, and he misquoted Yah, misapplied what he said, uh, and manipulated uh, Chawa, who was already predisposed to accept what he had to say, into making a horrific decision, and from that point on, it has all been a battle to do two things. One is to deny Dode's fulfillment as the Messiah and Zeroah of the first Moed Mikre, because there is no salvation for humankind, and we simply die. And we're either sent into Sheol, but there's no one who goes into Shamaim to be part of God's family. And, and this is the whole purpose of the book of Ezekiel, which is Satan's autobiography. If no one shows up for Yom Kippurim, it's over. Satan wins. And Yah was returning with his son for a family reunion. If there's no family for there to be a reunion then it's over. That's what's writing on this. That's very uh, profound. But, that, but that's the truth. That is, that is where this is all leading. And if you look now, there are many Yehudim who have become part of God's covenant family. But every one of those Yehudim are not going to be there on earth no. as among mm -hmm. those looking up and receiving Yahweh because they're all going to be harvested, gleaned during the Teruah harvest uh, three and a half years before that yeah. event. And so Understood. everyone that's there has got to be somebody that is a Israelite, a Yahud, that we are awakening, that we are convincing to listen to what Yahweh has to say, to accept Dode as their savior, as their king, as their Messiah, to embrace the, the Torah's presentation of the Bereth Covenant, to accept Yahweh's name. And if we fail, then it's all over. There is no eternity in heaven. There's no ongoing covenant family. It's God doesn't return. Dode doesn't return. There's no heaven on earth. It's over. And so if you look at the condition of his people, there isn't a single Jew in Israel that is acknowledging what we're saying tonight. There isn't a single Jew in Israel that understands that Dod is the Messiah, the Son of God, that he is the Zoroah, that he is the sacrificial lamb of God, that he is the one that made all of this possible, that he is the exemplar of the covenant. They won't even say Yahweh's name. And that has to change. And it isn't going to change by a subtle little nudge. There needs to be a family reunion. And God has put his chips all in on what we're doing. Now, could he do better? No, he couldn't. Why? Because there was no one else willing. So he made this work. So, so we're it, huh? We're it. <laughs> well, now, what, you want to know why the, the, the tushy gets sore sitting in the chair all day? That's why. Yeah. If you wonder why we're not anonymous anymore, that's why. If you want to know why we have a tendency to say, you know, I'm not here to make you happy. I'm not here to tickle your ears. I'm here to tell you the truth. I'm not going to tell you there's virtue in their religion when their religion is precluding you from being part of the covenant and robbing you of your soul. This is the truth. You need to hear it. You only have 10 years left, and most of you don't even have 10 years because the life is going to get really, really I mean, tough. But that's what we're here to do, and it's all in. And for you to say, well, you know, certainly God's not going to go all in on, on, on a goy. Well, yeah, he is. That's what he, he said. said so. He said so. Why did he say so? Because there were no Yehudim. That's why he said so. And why? Because the Goy was willing. He may not have been had much to offer, but what he did have to offer, Yahweh capitalized on by providing them with seven spirits, and those seven spirits are profound. 
And then you might say, well, you know, why doesn't God just speak for himself? Because Jews said we never want to hear from him again. And God said, I will honor your request. I understand your request. I will honor it. I will always speak through the individuals I chose. And that's what he did. That's true. And he's doing it again. This is how Yahweh operates. If you don't like the way he, he operates, you're not going to like heaven and eternity anyway. Because the only reason for us bringing uh, us going into heaven with him is so that we can do Good stuff end. together. Yeah. This is, why do you think God chose a 80-year-old, broken-down shepherd on the lamb in Arabia to go liberate his people if he didn't want to work with people? That's what he did. You know, why do you take a guy like Dode with all of the emotional baggage and say, this is my guy, this is my son, this is my exemplar, this is who I'm going to fulfill the seven Moed Mikre with. This is the guy that's coming back to anoint the Kaporeth, the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. This is the guy that's coming back to be King of Kings. Because even in eternity, God's going to stay in character, and he has chosen the person he wishes to work through. It's doubt. So why would you be surprised that he has chosen someone to work through now? It's what he does. And we do our our best to please him. It's the most fun thing, most rewarding thing, most enlightening thing in the world. You know, you know here's uh, uh, D volunteering to create that timeline, and you know that that is not a um, an easy thing, and it's it's not something that that uh, goes without some stripes because yeah. it's impossible to be uh, to be completely right, just flat out impossible. Um, you can't prove a whole lot uh, early. No, it's, it's 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 too long a period of time, and the and you don't have a perfect uh, uh, text to mm -hmm. uh, to put it yeah. together, and and you know quite frankly we don't have the capacity to understand time the same way that Yahweh does. But it's still and it's right. an exceedingly important tool, and uh, and Kirk, you're about to embark on uh, on one that may be even more grand don't than that. Don't scare me. Well, why do we do it? <laughs> and I want to tell you that the moment you write things down, you're going to have critics. Oh, oh sure. Uh, oh. Yeah. In fact, uh, D, I have even been one of your critics. It's a great timeline. I use it uh, virtually every day. You've got some <laughs> things in there that uh, that uh, don't add up. And uh, let me share some of them with you. And so, but that's part, if you're going to be part of the Covenant family, you don't get blown smoke. I mean, it's we have to be as honest yep. with one another as as our God tries to be with us. That's how we make That's things only, better. Yeah, it's the only way you can have a decent relationship uh, and a, an enduring relationship. Um, so this is our opportunity. This is our time to make a difference. We only have 10 years left. We're going to do everything we possibly can. And, and most of us only have um, six to seven years left. Mm -hmm. Really? Because uh, Teruah will, will be it. There will be a gleaning. Uh, and you won't come back uh, as physical beings, but spiritual beings, to witness Yahweh's return with Dote. Um There's a couple of us that, that will come back. Uh, one um, yep. is, uh, has, has been out of commission for a very long time, but uh, he is the perfect candidate for the job, uh, Elia. And um, uh, oh, for reasons hear that, uh, wait till they hear him. <laughs> yeah, um, and the fact is, I'm the other. Uh, whether somebody likes that reality or not, um, I, yeah, it's been exceedingly clear. Um, and so we're going to do all we can do uh, to have the family reunion. Please our Father. Fortunately for us, the two things are true. One is that Yahweh is not interested in winning a popularity contest. He doesn't even want the majority of people to agree with his covenant. Doesn't even want it. Uh, he wants those that would be wonderful to spend eternity with. And so we're not trying to win a popularity contest. If that were it, we've already lost. 
No, <laughs> I can that's assure not, you, that's you won't not, get more popular. <laughs> yeah, that's not the that's not the contest. The contest is have um, people there that genuinely know and love Yahweh, have anticipated His return with His Son, and have embraced Yahweh and Dode as their Savior. That's that's what we're about. And the second thing is that not only are we trying to win a popularity contest, but the, the second aspect of, uh, of all of this is that um, God's already told us what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. He's elated with the results. He's already seen the results. He's already told us. He's actually even quantified the results. He's told us what's going to happen. And he knew it long before we were born, and he's happy with those results. So in the end, yeah. um, what we do is found as uh, as pleasing. And you know, if if that's our contribution to uh, Yahweh's covenant family, it'll be a life well lived. And Indeed. That's why we do this program. That's why we write these books. That's why we edit these books. By the way, as an update on the edits, um, I think uh, as of uh, uh, tomorrow morning, I will have completed the rewrite of 15 books with 15 to go. So I've reached the midpoint of, uh, of removing all things. All things, uh, mm-hmm. Yosha. Well, it, it's a team effort. I'm, I'm getting um, oh, wow. every, every book I'm, I'm editing is from the latest copy that has been highlighted to alert me to problems by uh, uh, D. You did one. Jackie's done many. Molly has done many. And uh, Mike has, uh, has done many. So they, they, there's a highlighting system that they have uh, worked out. And, mm-hmm. well, I end up having to read the entire things from beginning to end. Uh, I, I'm alerted to the places that are, are troublesome. Then I go through and I rewrite them all, and then they go and edit them again. So, and then mm-hmm. uh, David uh, comes up with templates so that uh, they go back together quickly, and, and they get posted uh, uh, quickly on the uh, on the site. So uh, this this is genuinely a uh, a team effort, but we are yes. have done since we we learned, which was only like six months ago, or maybe less, that we learned that. Uh, when we're writing the third volume of Coming Home, that Dode volunteered to serve as the Pesach Gael, uh, and that Yahweh accepted his request because it was in everyone's interest um, that required us to rewrite all these books. I don't think it's been even six months, and we've um, we've reached the halfway point in our uh, in our edits. So I'm I'm Maybe. pleased with that. Wow. I am I am looking forward to getting the books corrected and. Uh, and uh, uh, up to stuff, and then I really want to be able to to complete volume three of of coming home. We're uh, we're about halfway through uh, it. It's about half of its its completed size, and uh, and then continuing uh, to um, peer into the prophets and and talk about the world that uh, that awaits us. And it is very very fast wow. uh, fast coming upon us. But I, I can tell you that if if all we do is get the other 15 books corrected, get them all on the uh, the bookshelf, uh, that we've done enough. There's more than enough information there, uh, and particularly the way the site uh, presents it. You can look up any word and find every use mm-hmm. of that word on the site. You can uh, uh, choose any uh, any book, any chapter, any verse of, of, uh, of it, and find every place that it's presented amplified or in summary form or talked about. Um, and and then you, every book's available in its entirety free. Um, so th- there is an enormous amount of information. And then there's the social media outreach where you can communicate and ask questions and present your mm-hmm. thoughts and ideas. And, uh, and uh, then there's uh, YouTube channels that, that play these uh, shows and, and sites that uh, mm-hmm. archive them and explain them and, and uh, uh, timelines on the site and, and videos that uh, explain what, uh, what we're all about. It's, 
it is a beautiful and resounding uh, message, uh, a voice calling out the wilderness to Yahweh's people for them to come home. And while 100% of this program has been devoted to us saying that our target audience is Yisrael, Yisraelites, and Yehudim, uh, because that is who Yahweh wants to uh, uh, bring home, uh, this offer is open to every goyim in the world. Gentiles are welcome. You can't be anti-Semitic. You can't be religious. You can't be political. No. You can't be conspiratorial. Oh, but if you're willing to walk away from that babble, religion, politics, uh, and conspiracy, and you're willing to embrace uh, Yehudim as God does. I mean, God knows, okay, they've been pretty creepy. But nonetheless... Uh, he's going to reconcile his relationship with them, and he loves them. So, you know, um, get with the program. You you can't be anti-Semitic and get into heaven. So uh, right. embrace that. And if you're Goyim, uh, then the same terms and conditions apply to you uh, to be part of the covenant. And the same benefits apply to you. And the same Moed Mikre invitations to meet with God apply to you, and the same Torah teaching and guidance apply to you, and the same prophetic promises apply to you. The same covenant, the same Torah, the same heaven, the same God, the same Savior, no matter if we're Goyim or if we are Yehudim. And yeah. I do think that as we we move past the millennial Shabbat, where well, there will be a, a distinction between ethnic uh, Yehudim and uh, Goyim, um, I, I, and you know, our our roles are still somewhat defined. I think once we move mm -hmm. past that, there'll probably be no distinction. I think I agree. that, uh, that I agree. we're just we're just all family, and this distinction in the in that first thousand years is actually favorable for uh, for Goyim, uh, at least most Goyim. <laughs> no doubt. And that, do, uh, yeah. and that we 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 get where <laughs> I was uh, I was um, about uh, seven or eight years ago. Seven or eight years ago, it was all opportunity and no responsibility, and that's where we are going to be as Goyim um, in the first thousand years. Where with Yehudim, there will be responsibility along with opportunity. Um, that's where the the Choder and the Nakri and the the Bashar are now. It's it's opportunity, but also responsibility. It's uh, opportunity without responsibility. That's the cool. That's that's the preferred status. And so, as we in the next thousand years, uh, we we can have some fun. Um, yeah. We'll often exploit the universe and have no other uh, responsibility. Sounds like a pretty cool uh, job yeah. to me. Um, but nonetheless, uh, as, as we move past that, we will be seven-dimensional beings, which means we're infinite in time, infinite in every way we can imagine. It is a, it's from where we are now, what we can see and experience and go and do. Imagine having that multiplied by infinity four times over. I can't imagine that, but yes, I get it. Yeah. But that is the dimensional change from being a three-dimensional huh? construct, a physical being stuck in time, to being seven-dimensional and having the entire universe, both big at the uh, galactic level and small in the molecular level, all available to you throughout all time. Mm. So um, mm. it's going to be an extraordinary experience. Well, thank you very much for, for uh, listening tonight. Um, uh, we didn't get very far, and they, and they miss more, as is our uh, policy, but uh, our, our, our proclivity, I should say. But you know, Thank if you God heard. wants us to cover a lot of material, then He needs to ease up on the amount of information <laughs> that He is providing <laughs> in that but he material. Said he don't change. But he so said he don't change. I, yeah, it's true. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, so. yeah, yeah, you know. Uh, and I think it's true for all of us. And I hope it is for most of the listeners of this program. The, the great joy is uh, is transitioning from, uh, well, coming to know 
and then transitioning from knowing to understanding. And if you can look at these words and draw out that kind of understanding so that it's pertinent and relative to your, uh, relevant to your life, and you see how father and son have worked together to make this wonderful offer that we can capitalize on, that's, that's the best use of our time. Well, what thanks. Yeah. Yeah, the most rewarding experience. So if you think we get carried away at it, um, it's true. Um, uh, for us, and I hope it is for you, this is the most wonderful, beneficial, exciting, enlightening, uh, emancipating, um, uh, confirming, confidence-building thing we can do. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, thank oh, you very yeah. much for uh, for yeah. listening to our program tonight. We look forward to being with us uh, next week. We will continue. And the Song of Dode, the marvelous uh, 89th song. May Yah bless you all. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Shalom, shalom. Good night, guys. Shalom.